personal God who has revealed himself in a personal way. He is the creator, the sustainer of the universe, and he is Lord and King. He rules and he reigns. And the way he does that in the Old Testament, the, the enthroned between the cherubim, that is talking about that special piece of furniture, right? The Ark of the Covenant. For those new to church, you know, re remember Raiders of the Lost Ark, Ark of the Covenant. There it is, boom. And you saw it in the movie. There it was. That was the place where God chose to manifest his kingly presence within the nation of Israel. And the only proper response, according to this declaration, to the nations of the world, to every president, to every dictator, to every king, to every prime minister, whatever kind of government you might have, the only proper response to the message that the Lord reigns is to tremble and shake, to shake in your war boots, piddle your armor off. That's what I said. that the big shots of the world ought to wet their pants. <laughs> Is this your first time here? I mean, what's the, what are you giggling about? Because every kingdom, every nation, every country, none of it's going to last forever. Only King Jesus will stand upon the earth, and the kingdom of heaven will endure. Amen. That's the declaration, and you need to get it in your heart. So remember now this, in this grand story we've been reading, that Israel's mission, the reason why God put them on that land and gave it to them wasn't for themselves. It was so that they could show the world what it looks like when a group of people live in community with Yahweh as king. The justice. The mercy, the shalom, the flourishing, the peace, the love. Yes. Now, God's plan all along was to have a human king to represent him on earth through the nation of Israel. And so that's why Moses would go on to say this to the people in Deuteronomy 17. We read this this summer. When they were getting ready to go into the land, he told them ahead of time, now, you're going to ask for a king. This is what God says, okay? It was always in God's heart to have a king. There are three offices that mediate between God and the people in the Old Testament. It's the prophet, it's the priest, and today we're getting introduced to the third one, the king. The king that's anointed by God. Look at what Moses will say. He says, when you enter the land the Lord your God is giving you, and have taken possession of it and settled in it, and you say, let us set a king over us like all the nations around us, be sure to appoint over you a king the Lord your God chooses. And then he goes on to give guidelines. I'm not going to put all the guidelines on the screen for you, but I'll tell you the basic story, basic guidelines. Here are the guidelines because here, here's the thing. The king of Israel, the king that was going to rule and reign over God's people in the Old Testament, they couldn't just do whatever they wanted to. They didn't have ultimate authority, right? And so there were guidelines. And here's what it says. God's chosen king must not acquire great numbers of horses. Now, I know that bugs some of you if you're from Loudoun County, but just calm down, okay? Because here's what God is saying. Here's what God is saying. You see, horses were the engines for the tanks. And they weren't tanks, they were chariots. Remember Ben Hur, you know, the whole thing, right? That was the ultimate weapon of choice. And what God is saying is this listen, in my people, in the king I will choose, they're not gonna be about amassing weaponry and all kinds of horses, right? Because some trust in chariots and some in horses, but who doesn't? People of God, right? And another thing he says, Th this king is not supposed to have a lot of wives. No cha-cha-cha chimichanga. No, sir. No. And another thing, they're not to amass a lot of gold and silver and wealth, right? 
No, no, no. And he goes on to finish up the guidelines. Here's what the king is to do. Check this out. Verse 18, check this out. When he takes the throne of his kingdom, he is to write for himself on a scroll a copy of this law. Now, when we think of law, we think of do's and don'ts and legalism, but the law for the people of God, that was the guidelines. That was the guidebook. It was a wonderful thing. It taught you how to live so you could flourish, right? The king is to have a copy of this, take it from the Levitical priest, and it is to be with him. He's to read it all the days of his life so that he may learn to revere the Lord his God. He's got to study it and obey it. Why? Because, listen, technically, he's not the one who rules. Yahweh is the one ruling through the king whereby justice and peace and mercy and love can flow. So the guidelines in Deuteronomy 17 are the measuring stick for all the kings you're going to read about in the next six weeks. If you don't have a book, I hope you're going to run out there and buy a book and you're going to read this with me. You're going to read our story, the story of God's salvation. It's all pointing to King Jesus and, and every king that comes to power, the, the, the measuring stick is going to be the guidelines that God gave Moses and Moses gave the people. And so here we go. First Samuel chapter 8, God raises up this prophet Samuel. And Samuel, I'm going to page 100, okay? This is 1 Samuel chapter 8. Samuel served God faithfully, and he was a godly king, right, who, who led effectively, but now he's old, and there's no heir apparent, and so the elders come together to try to figure out what they're going to do. And they discuss this with Samuel. You're old, and your sons aren't like you. They're not like you. Okay, And so this is what it says. Check this out because this is the moment in time right, where Deuteronomy 17 is going to be fulfilled. This is the moment they get to the land and they're going to ask, they're going to pop the question. Here it is. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. Samuel was displeased with their request and went to the Lord for guidance. Do everything they say to you, the Lord replied, for they are, not re for they are rejecting me not you. When you read through this chapter this week, you're going to see the heart of God breaking here. It's a tender moment. Do everything they say because they're rejecting me. They don't want me to be their king any longer. And he explains, you know, ever since they came out of Egypt, they're continually abandoning me. They're serving foreign gods. They're, 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 they're leaving me and going to others. So do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way a king will reign over them. Now, here's a question for the immerse group this week, your discussion group. If it was God's plan to have a king, why was he upset when they asked? Well, I'm going to answer the question. <laughs> it was because of their hearts. He knew the condition of their heart. He knew their motive. They were looking for an outward solution to an inward problem. Remember when Pastor Stephanie preached last week and she made this statement, right? When you get to Judges and you see the problems and the problems and the sin and the sin and the sin, that the reality is that their problem isn't to be solved out there somewhere because the monster is right in here. And so you come out of Judges, and it's the sin cycle, and they can't be faithful, and they can't be loyal, and you come out of Judges, and here's their solution. Well, maybe a king will fix it. And so God sees this. Their focus on a king as the their focus on a king as the answer, listen, allowed them to hide the reality of their own sin and unfaithfulness to God. They could stay comfortable in their delusion about their own spiritual condition if they had a king representing them and fighting their battles. I have a question for you, not a statement. Just a question, how many Christians over this next year will do the same thing during the presidential election? We'll use political fervor as a cover-up for our own lack of faithfulness to God, radical discipleship, no prayer life, no obedience to King Jesus. So maybe a different president will fix my problem. I didn't say anything. I just asked a question. <laughs> and besides, they didn't desire the kind of king that would lead them closer to God. 
When they had their hearts set on a king, they weren't thinking, can we have a king like Moses said, you know, somebody that would lead like, like Moses, you know, Deuteronomy 17. No, 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 no. No, they wanted a king. What does it say? So they could be like all the other nations. They weren't satisfied. He's like, they're rejecting me. God, Yahweh is saying, the personal God, the creator, the sustainer. He said, they've rejected me. You know how hurt that is? What, what, what are these people saying? Yahweh isn't enough for us. No, no, no. We want something else, something more. Doesn't this happen today so often in the hearts of Christians? I think primarily it's because we meet Jesus, we experience Jesus, but then we don't step on into discipleship and worship and going deeper and experiencing more of his glory, more of his love. We have such an amazing King Jesus. Oh, the way he led, the way he lived, how he has empowered. I mean, wow, what a king we have. What a king we have. But if you don't continue to fall more and more in love with him in an intentional way in your worship and your devotion to him, you can find yourself at a point where, well, you know, there, is there something more here? I mean, I, I often wonder why. I mean, we never learn. An, another book is written. There's more, you know, sensationalism and speculation and end time stuff and blood moons and roadways to Armageddon and this and that. And people getting all, oh, pastor, sending me emails. And, and I want to just kind of type back, is Jesus not enough for you? He's coming back again. Live for him. Teach your children to live for him, and everything in your life is going to be all right. Come on, somebody say, praise the Lord. Praise Amen. The Lord. So Samuel did what he was told. He warned them. This is what the world's kings are going to do. This is what it's going to look like. I'm not going to read a strategy here. I don't have time. I'll just summarize it. They're going to draft your sons into their armies. They're going to conscript you to make their weapons and tanks, chariots. They'll tax you. They'll tax you, really. <laughs> Come on, we're outside the beltway. Can I get an amen? amen. They're going to be takers, not givers. They're going to abuse their power for their own gain and plans. And I ought to preach this right on Capitol Hill. <laughs> I'm kidding. But look what verse 19 says. And the White House, by the way. But the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. Even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us into battle. Think about how messed up this is. Listen, God promised. Here's what we learned a couple weeks ago about the land. They're homeless. They get the land. But he says, that, listen, the land belongs to me. Here's how you can keep. Here's how you can stay secure. Stay loyal to me. Stay faithful to me. Stay in covenant with me, and you won't have to worry. Now, there's going to be problems. There's going to be trials. You're going to, you're going to have tests. You're going to have to stand strong. You're going to have, right? But, but that's how you're going to stay secure. But here's, here's, here's the thing. The, the, the key to their security was being faithful to God. Their problem was they didn't want to stay faithful to God, but they still wanted their security. So let's get a king to win the battles. Maybe a strong earthly king can allow us to eat our cake and keep our cake at the same time. Another king would one day walk upon the earth and declare this truth. You cannot serve two masters. You can't serve God and mammon. Mammon isn't just money. It's a world system. You can't serve them both. You'll be, your, your loyalty will be divided, and, and sure enough, you're going to begin to hate one and love the other. So they chose to place their hope of security somewhere else in the hands of political power and military might. Now, now listen. Is Pastor Scott saying don't vote? Does Pastor Scott vote? I vote. Okay? I get the sticker. I'm not saying run to the hills, Christians. I'm not saying don't get involved in that filthy business. Just run to the hills. I'm not saying I'm not talking about that at all. I'm talking about what I'm talking about here today, friends, is giving us a proper priority and context, okay? We don't have to have our heads spinning around all the time because of politics. What are we going to do? Ah! No, sir, because Jesus is king and Jesus is Lord. Amen. He is Lord. He is king. 
right? I'm talking about what you're going to place your ultimate security in, your ultimate sense of well-being. Listen, they chose to go with political power and military might and earthly kings, and that's always the cowardly way out. It takes godly courage to declare with conviction some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. Amen. And there will be a king, the, the, one, the poet king who wrote what I just read, we're going to preach on him next week. And so listen, moms and dads, this is Dedication Sunday, and we had 12 families, and there's a whole lot of other families, and then let's not even start talking, of, to talk about grandchildren and our concern for our grandkids. I'm going to have one in December. Glory be to King Jesus. Yes. Are you worried about your children's future? I hear that, I, I actually hear people say this, you know, we don't really want to have that many kids because we're just so concerned about the world and the way things are going and how divisive everything is and all that kind of things. Let me tell you something, friends. If you will love Jesus and you will serve him as your king, and if you will teach and model that for your children and pass that same on to them, Jesus will be more than enough for you. Do you hear me? He'll be more than enough. Now, that wasn't a very big clap. That's amen. Amen. And so in 1 Samuel chapter 9, page 101, begins the story of God giving Israel the king they wanted. It's a great story. If you haven't read it, I hope you'll read it. Don't miss it this week. Here's how it starts. So God says, okay, give him, give him the king. So here's, here's how it starts. So there was a wealthy, influential man named Kish from the tribe of Benjamin. His son Saul was the most handsome man in Israel, head and shoulders taller than anyone else in the land. Now, I want to give you the number one lesson here for the sermon this morning, okay? I want you to look at somebody else. You know how I like to, I like to take the focus off of myself? It gives me a chance to kind of freshen up. You look at somebody else right now. Turn to the person next to you. We have newlyweds on the front row. Dude, turn to your spout. Oh, she's brand. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, find somebody. Look them in the eye. You're gonna, you're gonna, you're gonna help me preach. All right. Lesson number one in kingdoms, part three. Here we go. You ready? Say it after me. Always beware, Always beware. of tall people. Oh. I'm telling you, you can't trust them. Go ahead and put a bunch of love notes for Dr. Doug out on the wall, okay? I'm sticking with it. So here's this tall, handsome man with a rich daddy, and he's going to become Israel's first king. And here's what you can't see in the campaign poster. The man has a massive inferiority complex. I mean, you're going to read this. It is a cool story. He's out on a mission for his dad looking for donkeys. By coincidence, he pat, his path crosses with Samuel, the prophet. Samuel takes one look at him, and God whispers in Samuel's ear, that's the one. Anoint him. Samuel tells Saul, and Saul's like, what, me, who? I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. It's the smallest. It's like being from Noakesville. I mean, it is, it's, it's small. <laughs> Catholic. I mean, keep going. I mean, this is Benjamin. My clan is the smallest of the clans. My family is the most insignificant family. I mean, nobody knows my family. Well, it just said in what we read, right, that his dad is wealthy and highly influential. This guy doesn't feel very good about himself. When it's time to go public, Samuel calls the nation together. They're going to come before God. They're going to pray, and then they're going to cast Lot to see where the Lot falls, and they bring all the tribes. It falls on Benjamin. I'm, I know, everybody's here. Everybody's here. The only people that know about what's going to happen is Samuel and Saul, right? And Benjamin's the one, and all the clans of Benjamin, and then here comes this clan, it falls on them, and then all the families in the clan, and here's Kish, and then all the sons of Kish, and the lot falls on Saul. Where is he? He's in baggage claim. <laughs> Read it. He's hiding, right? Never confuse humility with insecurity. They're not the same thing. They might look similar at the beginning, but over time, they look very different. So Saul is made king. Samuel explains the duties of kingship to Saul and the people. He writes it on a scroll. 
He's probably, you know, paraphrasing Deuteronomy 17. Maybe he's copying it right out of there, copying the scroll. Here's what a king does. Here's what you need to expect. Here's the responsibilities, right? Here's the privileges. And then he sends everybody home. Soon after that, an evil king, Nahash, set siege to the city of Kabesh Gilead. He says, I'm going to wipe you out, but I'll tell you what. I'll let you live, but I'm going to gouge out your right eyes, and you're going to serve me. What a deal. You're going to read this. So what do they do? They don't cry out to God this time. They got a king now. Better call Saul. They call Saul. The Spirit of God comes upon him. God gives him great victory. He's really the one. This is awesome. They call together an inauguration, a coronation. Long live the king. Long live the king. He sends everybody home again. Saul becomes now, listen, one page after another becomes obvious. This guy's not lining up with Deuteronomy 17. Saul becomes the, listen, listen, prototype of all the failed kings that we're going to read about in the next six weeks. And in fact, Saul becomes the poster boy for how not to lead. The crescendo is 1 Samuel chapter 15. God gives Saul instruction through Samuel. A time has come to bring judgment on the Amalekites. It's godly judgment. An evil, wicked king, Agag. The things he's doing to people. Their time is up. You need to go and bring judgment upon the Amalekites. And here's the thing. You need to go totally destroy them and all their belongings. Don't take anything for yourself. Do you know what Saul does? He keeps the spoils. What do we see? Abuse of power. God whispers to Samuel. You know what, Samuel? I got to tell you, I wish I'd have never had you anoint this bonehead. (laughs) Paraphrase, of course. I'm sorry I ever made him king. Saul cries all night. Page 111. 1 Samuel chapter 15, early the next morning, Samuel went to find Saul. Someone told him, you're looking for Saul? Saul went to the town of Carmel to set up a monument to himself. Oh, God. (laughs) Then he went to Gilgal. When Samuel finally found him, Saul greeted him cheerfully. May the Lord bless you. I have carried out the Lord's command. This is prototype, isn't it? Abuse of power, cover up. Saul has forgotten who the kingdom belongs to. He's making monuments to himself, right? Prototype for the kingdoms of the world. Remember how totally insecure he was. Winning battles, building monuments. What's he doing? He's trying to deal with his insecurity through worldly success and power. And we've all experienced it, haven't we? Haven't we all had to face our own insecurity, our own sense of inferiority? We're in over our heads, and we try to deal with it with all the smoke and mirrors, and the look at what I've done, and look at this trophy, and look at this bonus, and blah, 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 when the reality is the only one who can deal with your deep heart insecurity is the God who made you, and the God who loves you, and the God who's the only one who's qualified to do the kind of surgery that you and I need. Amen. Wow. Not only... You know, do you see abuse of power and cover-up from human kingdoms? But sometimes they're just plain dumb. I mean, he's standing before the prophet, and he's saying, Hey, I've obeyed the command of the Lord. Yeah. Me. <laughs> Next verse says this. Look what it says. Then what is all the bleeding of sheep and goats and the lowing of cattle, I hear Samuel demanded. It's true that the army spared. And here's, 
Here, here's what he said. It's true that the army spared the best of the sheep, goats, and cattle, Saul admitted, but they are going to sacrifice them to the Lord your God. We've destroyed everything else. Here's what Samuel says. Stop. Now I'm going to paraphrase. I'm a prophet, and you've just entered the no-spin zone. Because that's what human kingdoms do. They spin. Saul keeps up the spin, shifts the blame. Verse 22 records one of the most profound scripture in all the Old Testament. Even if you've never read Samuel, you may have stumbled on this or heard someone preach on it. Check this out. This is what the word of the Lord is. What is more pleasing to the Lord? Your burnt offerings and sacrifices or your obedience to his voice? See, we'll try to make up for the reality of our own disobedience and sin and rebellion in our deep heart by doing all this smoke and mirror stuff out here. Oh, wonderful. God sees through it. Obedience is better than sacrifice, and submission is better than the offering the fat of rams. Rebellion is as sinful as witchcraft, and stubbornness as bad as as worshiping idols. What happened next was how Ruth's great-grandson would begin to enter the story to become king. The next verse says, as Samuel turned to go, Saul grabbed him by the back and tore the hem of his robe. Rip! And Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today and has given it to someone else, one who is better than you. We're going to preach on him next week. But then notice how Saul reacts to the news. Then Saul pleaded again. I know I've sinned. I know that the Lord's ripped the kingdom from me. I know that it's all coming to an end. I know that's all. But please, look, look, listen to this. At least honor me before the elders of my people and before Israel by coming back with me so that I may worship the Lord your God. Like, I know I've lost the kingdom. I know it's been ripped from me but could you at least help me keep my approval ratings up? How about a little press conference with the preacher? A little worship. Because, you know, all presidents are born again, of course. Did I just say that? Let me finish up quick before I say something else that's going to create email. As you read the rest of the story this week, you'll see how Saul continued to slide deeper and deeper. This week, we're going to read about more jealousy and paranoia and rage and witchcraft and murder, abuse of power, cover-up, and finally, suicide. Who needs reality TV when you got the Bible? <laughs> Hallelujah. There's an ugly rumor out there that says the Bible is boring. Can I tell you what that is? Fake news. So let me wrap this up, because I'm thoroughly fed up with this sermon. This is the third time I'm preaching it. Don't forget the big lesson from two weeks ago about how to read the Old Testament. Remember the pancakes? I'm not going to show you the picture, because two weeks ago, people were leaving early to go to IHOP. There's multiple layers of story here. Never, just like a short stack, never just eat the top pancake. Ever. You eat the whole stack with butter between each layer. And syrup gooing all over it. That's how you eat a short stack. If you, if you only eat, read the top level of the Bible, you're not going to interpret it properly. See, we got the top level here. We, we've, you know what we learned today? All sorts of lessons about leadership. Everybody's a leader here today. Every one of you are leaders here today. You're leading someone. Someone looks to you. You're leading something. Saul is our poster child for how not to lead with integrity. A lot of lessons. But there's some deeper things going on here. And that's where we're going to dock this boat today. Listen. Listen. God wanted the world to see what a people look like when they let him be in charge. When they surrender to him as king. But Saul became the pro prototype for the many failed kings 
that we read about in kingdoms. And at the end of the book, yeah, I'm going to tell you how it ends. It's a big failure. It's a reminder to us that all human kings and kingdoms are headed to the garbage dump. It is only the kingdom of God that will last forever. Hallelujah. Amen. And everything we're going to read is going to point to the king that came. Right? Next week, we're going to see with David that he wasn't perfect. He was far from it. Far from it. But we're going to see with David, right? David had a heart for the Lord. We're going to see that. We're going to see where this deeper story heads. Saul's story reveals the reasons why all the world's kingdoms are doomed to fail. And only the kingdom of God will last. Do you know why? Because of the condition of the human heart. It's sin. It doesn't matter what form of government you have. We still have the same problem. Governments can make laws, but governments can't fix sin. They can't free people from what truly has them enslaved. It's only King Jesus and his eternal kingdom. And so as you read through the rest of kingdoms, remember these contrasts. Just a few I give for you today as we wrap up. With human kingdoms, it's always about the outward show. But God's kingdom is about inward substance. Next week, when we look at David, he's going to lead Samuel to find a new king. It's going to be different this time. He gets to the house of Jesse, and Samuel's thinking, tall, dark, and handsome like Saul. And God whispers in his ear, man, humans look at the outside, but God sees the heart. Human kingdoms are always spinning the truth. God's kingdom will always reveal truth, expose truth. The first way that you have to, I mean, the first step out of the kingdom of darkness, out of the kingdom of the world, out of the kingdom of Satan and his destruction in your life, and to step into the kingdom of God is to allow the light of King Jesus to shine and expose all the dark gunk in your life. It's surgery, but that's the only way. Repentance is the only thing that brings forgiveness and reconciliation and healing. The kingdoms of of this world are about self-focused pride. Aren't we great? Aren't we something? Aren't we awesome? Aren't we wonderful? Aren't we the best? Aren't we the greatest, the glory of man? But God's kingdom is always about glory to God and God alone. It's always about selfless submission. The way of God's kingdom is always the way of humility. Submission to the will of the Father. That's what King Jesus showed us when he came. Hey, human kingdoms are all about the love of power and abusing power, using it for yourself. But the kingdom of God is not about the love of power. It's about the power of love. So next week we'll look at King David and the promise God made to him that a son of David is going to one day come upon this earth and his kingdom is going to last forever. And that son of David would be Jesus, Messiah, son of God. He would bring rescue to the world. And how would he do it? He would do it in a way that the complete antithesis of every other kingdom and king and leader has ever led. It was the way of love, the way of the cross, the way of self-sacrifice. He would give his life so that you and I could be forgiven of our sins. Can somebody say amen? Amen. So that you and I could have an opportunity to have a relationship with the God who loves us. I close today with you standing. Wake up. Pick up your dirty tissues and put your shoes on. Throw your own coffee cup away. The message is this. Yahweh, the personal God, he reigns. You and I today have the same message and the same declaration of faith. Jesus Christ is Lord. 
Come on, let's say it together. Jesus Christ is Lord. Is he enough for you? Is King Jesus enough for you? Do you love him? Different kind of king. Never been one like him. Never will be another. He's the last word. We don't need any more sensational headlines. Jesus came. He's coming back again. Go live for King Jesus. That's it. Amen. Amen. So we're going to declare the truth from a letter from St. Paul to the Christians at Philippi living in the middle of the Roman Empire where Caesar was the big dog. But here's what the people of God would sing. Many believe this was a poem that went throughout the early church. Let's read it together loud and strong with conviction. Come on. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Hallelujah! Come on, give him praise today. Praise you, King Jesus. Amen. Amen. I got the game clock here, right here. I don't care what your watch says. We got time to close with a song. Pastor Josh, the team's going to lead us in a song. I'm going to come back in just a couple of minutes and dismiss us, okay? If you'd like prayer for anything, I'd like prayer teams to come under both screens and on the sides of the stage. Pastors be available as well. Deacons that are available, just be ready if you'd like prayer for anything. Or maybe you are ready to surrender your life to King Jesus and you'd like somebody to help you and pray with you. You come under the screens. We would be honored to help you with that today. Now, with hearts that are filled with love, may King Jesus become more and more real to you this week. May you fall more and more in love with him. May King Jesus be enough for you because he is. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus, 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 there's just something about the name Master Savior Jesus like a fragrance after the rain about that name.
Neath heaven's shadows Your crimson flood covers me Your crimson flood Your crimson flood covers me Sing Glory, glory We have no other king But Jesus, Lord of all send you out of here with our weekly admonition. I say this every week, but before I do it this time, I just want to speak a word to you. You can't receive the good news that Jesus is King until you receive the reality 
of just horrible news. I mean, because the reality is I can't save myself. The truth comes to you in two waves. The first wave is I am more wretched than I ever thought. I am, I am more lost than I ever, I'm, I'm, I, I'm, I'm hopeless. There's nothing in me that I can bring to, to God to talk him into me being a good person. I'm, I'm toast. I'm toast. It's, that, it's from that place of, of humility and brokenness that is the only heart condition then that the good news of King Jesus can come. Because the good news is, as wretched as you are, you are more loved and valued than you ever thought was possible. That the God of the universe gave his best for you. He loved you so much, longed so much for you to come home, right? That he gave his, his all. And so, Lord, we thank you. Some of you, some of you haven't really responded to the gospel. Yet. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. And so, Jesus, we repent. Come on. We turn to you, King Jesus. May all of our castles fall. All of our kingdoms give sway. And Lord Jesus, out of the ash heap then, may the gospel come pouring in, Lord, of how loved we are, how valued we are, how awesome what you have done for us, that we can now be children of God. Come on, amen. That we can be Christians, followers of King Jesus. Come on, amen. With a purpose for our life. Hallelujah. And the way King Jesus rules over you isn't with a bunch of do's and don'ts. He comes to the deepest heart of you. He comes to the very deepest part of you with his Holy Spirit. Jesus wants to be king in the deepest part of your being. He wants to set his throne room up through his Holy Spirit. That's the one that's going to empower you to live for King Jesus this week. Amen? Not by our puny power, but the power of King Jesus in us. Come on, amen? To God be the glory. Don't forget to get your grocery bag. Bring it back with groceries. Now let's go live for King Jesus. Amen.